opportunity to welcome you all to Sandy Ridge Ranch for our 2019 uh, pre-sale seminar. Tonight we have two speakers. We have Mark Anderson, with Executive Director with the North American Limousine Foundation, and then Dr. Sandy Parr with Feedlot Health. And Sandy will be walking through a lot of the carcass data sheets that, that you all get from us on, on your calf crop. So with that, we are going to get started and we'll look to Mark to kick off the evening. And feel free, between speakers, we'll, we'll take a little time for questions and then at the end we can, we can also take further questions. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark. I appreciate you guys inviting us up here and get the chance to get in front of you tonight. Um, they start the timer, so I won't go long. And don't let the sheets intimidate you. There's a lot of genetic trends and stuff as we go through it. But my background for 20 years is primarily in feed yards and feeding cattle and buying feeder cattle. And I've been blessed to work with now for the last seven years now. And really at the right time because it's, it's to a point as far as genetics go, it's, it's about to get fun. Okay. As we look at some of the changes, what I'm going to do, because I'm talking to a lot of commercial cow-calf producers here tonight, and we have folks like the Wolf family up here, Wolf Cattle Company, they spend a lot of money. And what they're doing is trying to make a better product for you, the commercial bull buyer out there. <clears throat> you keep increasing and enhancing the value of your feeder cattle trade. And the tools that we have now, that we didn't have just five, ten years ago are really kind of neat. So I better get going or the timer is going to hit. Um, the genomics that we're doing now, today, it's a different deal. You know, we had genomics incorporated into our cattle runs here basically about five, six years ago. And we used a different value on trying to blend those genomics into the EPD runs. And as we go through the presentation, what I'm going to try to do is tell you how that's changed to where hopefully it's more understandable of what kind of value that not only has to our seed stock breeders, but it improves the accuracy of the cattle you're trying to buy in your bull batteries today. And you're going to know what those bulls can do before they hit the gap ground running. I was talking to a gentleman from Montana. He said, Mark, it's basically three years from when I buy a bull before I know really what I've got on the ground and he's proven. And the good news is everybody gets an earlier peak now. Bolt is a single step cattle evaluation that we're doing through International Genetic Solutions out of Bozeman, Montana. The American Semitol Association started it. You hear the Hereford and Angus, they do run their own EPD sets. This single step, actually what it does, when we run these cattle evaluations on a weekly basis now, we used to come in, before I go any farther, the coolest thing about IGS, the 13 breeds that are involved in it, the primary reason it was done is you can compare all your EPDs across these 13 different breeds of cattle now as a commercial cattleman, and they're comparable. They're on an even basis. So if they're an IGS contributor or cooperator, when you're looking at the EPDs that are, pr are produced in your bull catalog, they're comparable across breeds. Now, IGS, we used to come in with these EPDs and genomic enhance them, and they generated what they call a molecular breeding value, MBV. And all it was was a 1 through 10 score on each one of the traits that are listed in your catalog. And it was kind of a monotonous process. And what's happening now, these folks are taking the actual genomic DNA marker information instead of a 1 two, through 10 score, it's getting calculated off those genomic markers every week and blended into that EPD tray. So what that does for us increases the accuracy of the EPD. It lets Wolf Cattle Company, and by the way, every bull that you see in their catalog, and the reason they spend all this money is they're getting the early peak because it's an increased accuracy on that animal's actual value. And we'll get into that when we look at progeny equivalents. The bull single step you still got to be a cattleman, right? There's no EPD for structure. They got to be sound. You got to get your eye out there. We want cattle with some depth of rib and some body and some condition to them. But the single step combines the genomics with the progeny data as that gets developed and turned into the breed association, along with the performance data and the pedigree information is all combined into one 
So we've got a bolt single step genetic evaluation. They're weekly, we spend these, it runs out every Sunday night. The upload happens, you know, the following morning for the next round of genomic markers going in. More weight trait data is turned in. As you look at the EPDs in your catalog, you want to pay attention to the accuracies along with the EPD. The reason this thing got exciting is the progeny equivalence. So when we get a new young sire out there in production or you're looking in your catalogs, since these folks have done all this work and they've spent all this money getting these cattle genomically enhanced, it's all about the progeny equivalence. And as we go through these traits, you can see just the progeny equivalence that comes from genomic testing. It's like an having 21 calves on the ground already for birth weight, 22 for leaning weight, 24 for yearling weight. And you can see down here in the carcass traits, it's still a pretty good deal. If it's up there at six or eight, well, that's eight years of calves. Okay, out of that one mama cow. So we already got a lead on not only what our good cattle are from a seed stock producer standpoint, but we can get rid of some of the other cattle that maybe don't have quite the production and then we get that early peak into if it's a, if it's a flyer or a cut, okay. This slide's a little outdated, but I left it in. We still need performance data. So as these seed stock producers turn in birth weight, weaning, and yearling weight, and scan data, look how these shoot up. This category, it says performance. When we start to get that weight trait data turned in on cattle, some of these get up like they're having progeny equivalents in the 20s and 30s, and you haven't even spent anything on the ground until you start adding that performance data. A lot of folks think, well, we'll just genomically enhance our cattle and we won't turn in performance data. And the great thing about wolf cattle, they do it all. And they've got the most accurate EPD sets. Um, there's a lot of other operations around the country producing seed stock, but they live it, they breathe it, and they're very meticulous in turning that data in. So when you get into their catalog and you look at all the EPD track on there, Here's Wolf's conversion. In case you give me a couple of bulls they've had out for a couple of years now, this is a purebred bull. Any one of you can get on our website at mouth, enter in a bull's uh, registration, look him up. These EPDs, if they've been genomically enhanced in our data system, they'll be highlighted in yellow, and then it'll have the siren down. You can look at like a good bull like this, he's good numbered all the way through, good on the weight trait data, he's good over here on the carcass side, particularly for a beer bed bull, he's fantastic. We know we get a lot of yield with limousine on edible red meat product, but I think if, if you look, start looking at the accuracies, and you'll see that they inch up higher on these cattle that have been genomically enhanced, okay? They're not down there at 0.2, 0.26, and as they get babies on the ground, and they've been genomically enhanced with performance data. They get up there at 0.7, they start running at 0.9. These cattle all have a higher accuracy value. When you come onto this ranch, and all the dollars that are spent on trying to breed the good one, the right kind, there's a lot of science behind it. So I think you can have confidence. This is a good limb flex bull that they've got. Um, that Wolf's Envoy K116E, you know, big body, good rib bull. You can tell he's made right structurally but he's got the numbers to back him up. So most of the cattle that make it through the cut to this sale, they're enhanced the way that they weren't five years ago with the genomics and the new cattle evaluations that are done on single step. They're trying to give you the best cattle that they can and they're backing up with the data and the science. They not only uh, genomically enhance most of their AI sires and donor dams and their bull offering, they're going after their cow herd too and that makes those EPDs accuracies fly. So it's, it's neat changes coming at you. We didn't realize, we didn't go to IGS for our cattle evaluation until about two years ago. Limousine breeders knew their cattle were good maternally, okay? Till we started comparing other breeds, we just didn't realize how good. Limousines represented on the red line. And this is just in digital beef that does registry books for about six other breeds, okay? But it gives you an idea, and I'm gonna zing through some of these traits. I'm only got 16 minutes left, so it's, it's gonna be fast. <laughs> but you can see down here on birth weight, limousines in the red, I think uh, Gelby's the light blue, and we've got some others listed in your handout. The wean and weight trend, they're right out on the top end of it, okay? 
This is just comparing to other breeds in digital beef. Same way on yearling weight, the red line's kind of right on the top end. You know, pounds or dollars, it's a big deal. Doesn't matter whether you're selling them over the scale or you're weighing those cattle and selling them in a the carcass basis in a formerly grid. Limousine milk, they can talk a long time, but I won't. They're about right. And there's a sweet spot at 21. We can't give milk too high or we have too much maintenance and feed cost into the cow for breed back. We're running in cow country. And there's a, you look at a lot of these bulls in your catalog, I'm telling you, you get down in that 14 to 21 range, that's probably enough milk, okay? We don't, want to, we don't need cattle that are up there at 26, 28. You know, I mean, it's too much feed cost, too much maintenance, and the ability for that cow to breed back. Total maternal, um, towards the top end there, that's the weight and weight average with the milk EPD. Cavanese, sit up there towards the top end. Stayability, just maintaining and keeping that cow in the deal, and limousine's kind of right in the middle, you know, top two or three there. Docility, biggest testament to EPDs at work. The knock on limousine for years ago was docility and temperament. They were one of the first breeds that started addressing it about 20 years ago. Now they're ranked number one, okay? Now, we all got some cattle that got some temperament problems, but they've done a good job and addressed it. And it's cool to look at what limousine's done with their EPD track on docility, because good docility leads to a lot of good, a lot of other good things like intake, marbling, and all the good things that come with it and keeping your crew alive. Um, yeah, a little joke there. Uh, anyway. After 25 years, you know, I, I'm proud of them, and, and they, they take their herd book to heart as a breed. So you're a commercial buyer in here. These folks have really selected to kind of get their thing cleaned up, and it is. Um, carcass weight, kind of on the top end up there, too. As we look at uh, ribeye, we're always known for our ribeye. Those of you guys that want to clean up some yield grade on some commercial black cows or English, there's not a better breed to do it with. And we know that with the yield grade, we're looking at the four components of KP, carcass weight, um, back fat, and ribeye. This, these are bulls that can do it. Fat thickness, like you would expect, they're on the top in there, being on the bottom at the top on this graph. Marbling, starting to work on it pretty hard now, and they're coming up. And we'll talk a little bit more about it on some of the other comparisons. This is a crossbreed comparison that you can do now. And man, the clock's ticking. Okay, birth weight and weaning weight. You look at limousine and the Limflex hybrid, uh, Gelby, Red Angus, Shorthorn, Simmental. You can see on these Cavanese numbers and all the way through maternally, both limousine and Limflex, they, they look great in the deal. And I think on the weight trait data, you know, you get heterosis from a hybrid. So you see that big yearling weight number on the Limflex hybrid up here at 100. Compare it down to the Simmental hybrid at 101. And you've got great numbers on your purebred set up here at 91, and you can kind of look down through these numbers, and that's why we feel so good at where limousine's at today. But we got a lot of folks that do a lot of good job of turning data in this herd book, and they pay attention to it. Wolf versus limousine average. I like that quote in there because Leonard had said, and I stole it off your guys' website, we were cattle feeders before we were cattle breeders. And I take that to heart because that's what I did for 20 years. And now I can see the application of it at the cow-calf level in seed stock business. It's happening at this ranch, folks. It's a really cool deal. They added the genetics to this thing and started doing this heavy in 71. We know limousine advantages and feed efficiency, dressing percent, and yield rates. And this DNA work with genomics and all the way trade data now, I mean, let's face it, we're all trying to make choice yield grade two cattle, yield grade two cattle are better, regardless of the color. This breed brings in the ability, and if you apply the technology that we have now, we get there faster. These folks have cattle on feed, over 40,000 of the beef builders, which is the Jersey Limousine Cross, and then over 55,000 native cattle, as you folks are aware, throughout the United States. So they do it on both ends. They know the importance of those closeouts, that pack and house data, and then keeping those cows in that cow base on an economical, efficient basis. 
I gotta show you something, and I don't want to steal Sandy's thunder here, just real quick how good these cattle are. These are just their natural cattle, no implants. Grading up here at 80, 90 percent choice. Yield grades are still good. Uh, fours and fives are only 24 percent now, and then naturals, that's a pretty good deal. There's no 180 milligram TBA in there burning that off. Um, Ribeye up here at 14, it's outstanding. Carcass weight to AAA, and that's on a substantial amount of cattle. The commodity cattle, of course, are implanted, still up here in the 70s on their percentage choice. Only 13% yield grade fours and fives. Big old ribeyes in the cattle and weight production behind it. The business has changed, okay? We're not in the 90s having a war on fat anymore. Look at what percentage choice and prime has done in the feed or the packing industry over the last, since 05. We're up here around 80%. In some cases, it's getting higher. Hey, there's sometimes the year they're paying 15 up as much as 30 bucks on their weight more on an eight weight carcass or bigger carcass now. And that's how old I'm getting, Jerry. But that's dollars. Now, if we can make those cattle all hit, you'll grade one to three, hit the marbling deal. Money talks, demand pulls through, but it's been a big change in the way we're making the kind of cattle we're making today, too. This outfit, it's really cool. They share their information. If you've got feeder cattle up here, these guys give you back your kill data, and the carcass data by ranch, but they share that health data too. That's a big deal. We talk about genomics. I used to feed a lot of cattle. I get a lot of sons out of a nameless bull I won't mention. I start getting brisket disease, and I can trace it back to them about every time. Think of what's in front of you guys the next five to 10 years, okay? They'll find stuff on these DNA markers eventually. I think it's going to be, think how much money we spend on vaccines and saving pneumonias and death loss. And there's a lot of environmental things that affect that. Somebody's going to find a bull that's going to be resistant to some of these strains. And over time, they're probably going to get it figured out. Wolf against the limousine average. Real quickly, the yellow line is the limousine average. And you look how much it's worked for a wolf cattle company. Cavities, they're the red line. They're on top of it there. Birth weights, right where they want to be, tad underneath the average. Wiener weight, out in front of it there. And these you can see are the numerical scores that correspond with them on their cattle. I just want to see how much hard work and perseverance pays off to somebody that's paying attention to detail. Yearling weight, same way. Big shot to the north. Total maternal, they're out in front of it there. Cavanese, right with the average in the deal. I mean, these are Cavanese bulls for the most part. You look at the whole herd, scrolls right in there, big uptrend line through it, and right up right with the breed average. Stability, look how far out in front of it they are as a company on that cow. It's pretty cool. Docility, the breeds come up to be number one. Look where wolf cattle sits, up there around 16. When we went to Bolt, our breed, we took a breed average shift. That, I mean, it used to be nine, 12 is the average now, and these guys are up there around 16. So I'm trying to call out and get some of the calmest cattle they can, and they're doing it. Yield great, just like you'd expect. They're kind of right up in there. The thing that's really cool, carcass weight, up, big, big up trend line, ribeye, they're way out in front of it. That's that yield grade portion we're talking about as far as lean yield, just product in the cattle. We're not making fat. We're not trying to make enough to marble those cattle without a lot of external. Um, look at the jump and how hard they've come up on their marbling numbers the last three, four years. The, the, the whole breeds come with it. These guys are out in front of it. And they get direct experience with it. can think how many cattle they ship to Tyson on a weekly and monthly basis. So. Um, dollars send the signal. Fat thickness like you'd expect. Um, terminal index, it's our mainstream terminal index. It applies most of those carcass traits and they're way out on top of it, um, continually moving up. It's just a summation of how much time, money, and effort they put into everything from DNA testing, performance data. You're looking at uh, an outfit that takes professional seed stock production to the varsity level, folks. The whole industry has done it though. Look at beef production. I stole these from my old buddy at Califax. 
29 billion pounds is the green line. Okay. Back in 1954, if you look at the red line, this is the cattle inventory. We had 132 million head here in the 70s. Remember those days? I, look how much we've done with genetics and production and still running up at beef production this high. Okay? But we're not done. Everybody wants to clean that bottom third up. It's going to get more efficient as we go through it, but I think the thing that's striking to me is you cut the cow herd back down here to 90 million head and you're still knocking out that kind of beef production. So genetics has played a big role in where we are today in trying to supply the country with product. Beef cow inventory, we've dropped from 40 million cows back to 32 million cows and we're cranking out that kind of beef production. It's pretty impressive. Exports, you know, all we talk about quality grade and yield grade. The export business has added over $350 a head to the value of the Fed steer, okay? It's a blessing to have it back in here, and it's not over with. If you're sitting in these seats and it's been tough, a tough winter, tough margins, let Trump get done with China. There's a lot of people to feed over there, a lot of mouths to open up. That old market gets opened up, hang on. I mean, it can get kind of interesting. We've continually increased, oh, I think I, I don't know, I don't see that slide anymore. We sent a lot of product over to Asia, Japan, uh, Taiwan, that thing's opened up. Now, you know, we keep getting 12 to 15 percent increases on our export levels. That helps us all. Limousine and Limflex cattle, they're being fed into a lot of program cattle deals for natural and NHTC throughout the United States anymore. Um, we know that they're perfect um, as far as, you know, knocking into a set of straight bred English cows, but even as standalone, Limflex or Limousine, we clean up, I, I think, a tremendous job on yield grade, and we can increase dressing percentage if the cattle are fed to their correct out date. Um, a big thing we don't talk about much, and I had it happen in my yard. The minute I got some limousine genetics and I had to feed longer to fill program cattle, and these guys are more aware of it and do more than anybody, I can feed my cattle bigger and not root my feed to gain conversion, hold my cost to gain together, and let's face it, if I'm getting $1.26 for a fat steer and it's only costing me 70 cents a pound to put it on, I'm rolling that break even back. These cattle give me another one, 200 pounds of outcome and do it efficiently and still maintain their yield grades. Limousine Limflex make a darn good set of cattle into that packing house and into that feed yard. Um, we know they work in a crossbreeding program very well. We talk about the advantages for yield grading and feed efficiency. But we're going to see more in these genetic evaluations. You'll see more things for dry matter conversion. As we move over the next three to four years and the good things that come out of a single step deal with IGS, we'll see more traits tracked with economic importance. And we're going to be able to track more carcass data over the next four to five years as we record that back to some of these herd sires. Um, the Red Angus and Angus deal, and I never forget it the first time I came here, Jerry, you talked about Limousine complements Angus, or Red Angus, very well. The two breeds work together and make an awesome set of cattle to feed and slaughter. So they're very complementary of one another. A purebred, as a standalone, somebody that's worked on their marbling EPDs, this is a big deal. This is a set of purebreds fed to for fairly large out weights, but you look at these cattle, where's the grade up here? 95 and 88% choice. This is on purebred limousines. But what's rare about it is, look, in the yield grade one and three, they're almost all right in there. There's not many fours or fives. And they're making the cattle that big. That's tremendous. Those cattle knocked out 190 to $212 premiums. Kill a pen of 200 of them times 200 or 20,000. That's a lot of money. And that's on the set of your red limousine cattle. So these guys have, done a lot of work. They had a successful year at Denver. They won both our uh, limousine pen bowl show and the Lemflex bowl show for our pen shows here in Denver. But you get out and you see in these corrals how stout, how good boned. We all have to be cattlemen in the EPD set. What, what I would say is when you look at them now, you can have more confidence. There's been a tremendous amount of dollars spent by these folks and others um, to get those accuracies up 
They're using all their performance data. They're genomically enhancing those EPDs. These EPDs mean more than they ever have. So look at those and look at them with confidence. You kind of get to know before you drive the car. <coughs> Instead of waiting three years like we were talking out in the hallway, it gives you an early peek what that bull is going to do for my cow set. As you get a chance, if you're ever interested, you can pull this up on the NALF Digital Beef website. You can actually search for minimums, maximums on these traits. It'll query a bull list out for you. I've sorted my purebreds, parents or non-parents. If I want a uh, horn, polled cow, I can click that in. Or if I want homozygous black, I can go chasing it. It'll pull you a list of cattle. The big thing is there, a lot of our breeders do that, is they're trying to make better genetics. They can get into our stuff now, and they can run those queries. And with the science that we've got, you can get there so much faster. It's almost incredible. I'm kind of the end of it, guy. If I'm two, your two guys' ages out there, you got a lot of neat things coming at you, and there's my beeper saying I need to shut up. All this talk is just trying to say there's meaning, all the effort, all the dollars. When you look at those EPD sets and all the money these folks have spent, they're backed by data dollars in the genomics and the performance data. They're an awesome set of cattle. Thanks for having me, Jerry. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I stand corrected. We're going to hold the questions until the end, um, and we'll take questions for both speakers. And, and now we'll, we'll turn it over to Dr. Sandy, who um, has been a big help in, in putting together the, the carcass reports that, that you all receive. And a, a quote from Robin this spring when we were putting this together, which used to be like a month-long process, said that um, I thought we could only dream of a day where we could do this with the click of a button. And, and that's what Sandy's helped us do, um, you know, streamline this reporting process. And, and with that, be able to, um, you know, as Mark talked about, some trends that are, you know, within the breed. Also, um, you know, seeing that working with producers, we, we met with a few guys this morning and, and can look over the years that they've been, you know, doing this program and working with us and the feedback for three, four, five years and, and the changes they've made, you know, and then there's new producers in the room that have, you know, maybe come from a, a straight Angus cow herd, you know, straight Angus calf crop, and, and as we bought those cattle and over the years, you know, they've changed the yield rate on the cattle, changed the ribeye size, and, and we've been able to feed those cattle the higher outweights. It, it, it correlates very well with some of the stuff Mark said, and, and it's, you know, with the help of Feedlot Health that we're able to, you know, put that together, you know, see that change and, and I guess make progress. So with that, we'll turn it over to Sandy. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate the, the introduction, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to speak at uh, the bull sale. I grew up in Oklahoma, and uh, I went to school at South Dakota State for a little bit, so I was very familiar with with wolf cattle, and I never would have thought that I'd be invited to speak here, so thank you very much. So um, we'll, we'll get, to get started on uh, this talk, and there's three main things that I really wanted to, to go through with you guys today. So number one, we, uh, we had the opportunity to change up the reports just a little bit. And so we wanted to go through the reports and explain um, how to interpret that. And along the way as we're going through that, we'll do a little refresher on uh, carcass uh, quality and yield grades and what that means for, for those of you that are, are a few years past school and may not be that familiar with going through carcass data. Then the last thing we want to talk about is the effect of um, management on uh, carcass data. So the feedlot can do quite a few things that, that are going to influence the grading of the cattle and we want to go through and point some of that out. So some things to think about when you're looking at your, your carcass data. So on the reporting side, uh, we still have cattle split up by program. So cattle that are sold into the national program, those that are in the NHTC program, and then those that are on the, the commodity side. 
and then we have the specific source, so your source of cattle relative to the database, and then we have the, the differences. And I'm going to go through just a little bit of the algorithms here in a minute um, so that the colors make, make sense. Assuming, Robin, they were printed in color. They were a quality right now. So these top three, for example, abundant, moderately abundant, and slightly abundant, all equal to prime. And when we're into a grid, we're going to get a premium for prime. We may or may not get a premium for choice, may or may not get a discount for select, just depending on how the grid flows, and then we're definitely going to get a discount on a standard or no roll type carcass. So that's just a little bit of a refresher in terms of marking score and getting to quality grade, which is how we're paid on a grid. I talked about others. So when we have problem carcasses, in your carcass reports, you'll see a category other. The majority of the time, that's going to be associated with a dark cutter. So that's a, a carcass that that muscle is darker than expected. And so we're going to get a discount potentially on that. And we're also going to be discounted because we have an older animal. All of the youthful grades, prime choice select standard, are going to be based on less than 30 months. If you're between 30 and 42 months, you're going to be a B maturity. So you can still get a youthful quality grade, but you have to have a higher marbling score in order to get that quality grade premium. And then beyond that, you get into, commer you get into cow grades, basically. And so um, that's just a little bit of how the age can play into the marbling score and how you, what quality grade you're, you would receive. So now let's get into a little bit of details on the report that would have been sent out. And if I'm, I'm guessing there's people in the room that didn't get a report, so we'll just kind of go through how it would work if, you know, in the in the future if you get one of these reports. So I've got a couple different examples for you. Um, the top one, we've got um, quality grade, so we're starting out with prime. So we've got our example at 31.9%, and then we've got our database at 19.09. So the difference is 12.81. That's green because our example had a higher percent prime compared to what the database is. If we, we're looking at this in terms of a grid, so if it's green, it means that you beat the database on, on a grid. If it's red, you didn't. But we're only looking at specific variables. So I'm going to move over here to choice, because we can see right away we're 9 and 9.6% less choice. So it's going to be red. But are we really upset about that? No, because if we take a step back, we got more prime. So the cat went into the, the prime category. And then for each one, if you have less select, less no roll, less other, that's going to be green. Okay? Make, make sense on, on uh, how these reports work and how the, the color coding just gives us a, a quick idea of, of how the cattle are grading relative to the database. Next, we'll move over, over to the other side of the grid and talk about yield grade. So the yield grade equation is based on uh, carcass weight, ribeye area, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat, as well as rib fat. And so it's, it's a regression equation, and the whole point of yield grade really is to go in and give, us, give the plant an estimate of the closely trimmed boneless retail cut. And so yield grade one would have the highest predicted cutability. It's expected to be greater than 52.3%. Five would have the, the worst amount of cutability. They're less than 45.4%. So from the plant standpoint, if you're a yield grade one or a yield grade two, you're going to be yielding more retail cut for them to be able to sell. So they will give premiums on the yield grade one and two side, and then on the other side of it for four or five, you have less product, so they discount those products. So the, that leads us into talking a little bit about ribeye area and ribeye area relative to carcass weight. 
because I know that that, that is a, a new item that we've included on the reports this year. So ribeye area is an indication of muscling. And as we increase ribeye area, we're assuming that we're, we're going to be increasing the amount of muscle in that carcass. So therefore, we would have a, a better yield grade, more ones and twos, better cutability. Now, why would we want to look at the ratio of ribeye area to carcass weight? Well, because we're really interested in seeing if the amount of muscle that that animal is depositing is keeping up with the size of that animal. Because you can be bigger, but not necessarily have the muscling to go with it. And so, as an example of how that, that is calculated, it is pretty straightforward. If we have a ribeye area of 14 and a hot carcass weight of 780 pounds, then we would just take 14 divided by 780. That gives us a number of 0 0.0179. Well, what does that mean? That 0 0.0179 square inches per pound of carcass. Now, in the beef industry, we often think about things in terms of 100 weight. So if you just take that number and multiply it by 100, you'd get to 1.79. So 1.79 square inches per 100 pounds of carcass. So that's uh, a little bit of an explanation of, of ribeye area in relation to carcass weight and what we've included on those reports this year. So if we really zoom in, and look at our example report. Um, I'm going to jump over here to ribeye so we can see that uh, our example population has a smaller ribeye area, so uh, 0.87 square inches less relative to the database, as well as having uh, a poor, poorer carcass weight to ribeye area ratio. And all that makes sense because if we go over here and if we look at our indications of cutability, which is yield grade ones to yield grade fives, everything's matching up. In this population relative to the database, we have less ones and twos, and we have more fours and fives. Now, three on a grid, three is typically bar, par. So that one was a little bit where we were on the fence. We decided to make a yield grade three be positive or green if it was greater. But it doesn't, it's, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier. So let's go down to this, this bottom example. So in this population, we have, relative to the database, more ones and twos, and we have less fours and fives. So we, are we upset we're, in the case where we have less threes? No, we don't, no, we're, we're stepping out. So just look, look at these individually, but then take a step back and look at how that distribution is. So that's, that's the reporting and the, the just brief carcass side of things. Now we'll jump over and we'll talk about factors that, that influence the, the carcass. So to start out with genetics, we all know that genetics play a role in, uh, in carcass quality and that's why you're, you're here today. But I'm not going to talk about genetics. I just felt that Jerry might be upset if I didn't mention it. So we know it's a factor, but we're not, not going to talk about it. The other thing that we know is a factor is the environment. So if we have a, a, a winter and a spring like this year where we've got a lot of mud. We know that mud, snow, you name it. We know that cattle aren't going to gain as well. They're going to be lighter. That can have influence in terms of what the, the carcasses are grading. So environment plays a role. It's a, it's a, it's a toss-up what, what it, the results are going to be from year to year. So it's a factor we're not going to talk about it. What we're really going to focus on is the effect of management and marketing at the feedlot and how that can have an influence on um, quality grade. So there's three things that, that I, I want to go through with you just to give you examples. The first one is going to be carcass weight, then we'll talk about technology, and then lastly we'll, we'll get into a little bit of uh, examples on, on diet, previous plant and nutrition, bunk management, and how that can play a role. So, um, I'm going to take a second, because I don't have a pointer here, but I'm going to take a second to explain 
these graphs because there's going to be four or five slides with graphs in it. So the way that um, <clears throat> these are set up, we're either going to have quality grade or we're going to have yield grade. So we can see those along the bottom. And then along our y-axis, we have the, the percent. So we can look over, for example, this blue bar right here in the middle, choice, we're at about 57% choice. So that's how all of these graphs will be set up. If you don't like looking at graphs, you can just see the numbers here. Okay, makes sense how to interpret those? Okay, so the effect of carcass weight. This one is a big one. So we conducted a large pen study in which we randomized the cattle into three groups. So we randomly put them into three, three piles and then we looked at marketing these cattle at average of 830 pounds, average 860 pounds carcass, all carcass, or average 890 pounds. And what do we see? As we take these cattle heavier, we are increasing the amount of choice, going from blue bar to orange bar to gray bar. As we take cattle heavier, we're selling less select. Okay? So as you increase carcass weight, you should be improving your choice and decreasing your select. We're putting more fat on the cattle. Now, conversely, anytime we're putting more fat on the cattle and we're happy with the quality grade, we're probably not going to be too happy with the yield grade and the cutability. And so that's what we see here. So as we take the cattle heavier, we are decreasing our, our percentage yield grade ones and twos, increasing threes, fours, fives. That happens all day long, and that's the biggest thing to keep in mind. This feedlot is going to be taking cattle to the end point that makes sense, depending on what their feeding margin is going to be. And, and that can have a, a pretty big factor on how the, the cattle are going to grade. Okay? The other, the other um, management factors that we want to think about, the big one is implanting. And so there's a lot of reasons to implant in terms of increasing average daily gain, improving feed conversion. But the one drawback to utilizing an implant is the effect on quality grade. And so there are things we can do to try to mitigate that effect on quality grade, but it's still there. And so the example that I've I've got on the, the slide for you is utilizing a low dose implant up front at a feedlot arrival compared to using a high dose implant. So that's kind of the blue bar versus the gray bar there. So if we utilized a low dose implant at arrival, we end up with a higher percentage of choice relative to if we use that high dose implant at arrival. And there's also some things we can do in terms of utilizing a, a different terminal implant. A moderate dose implant is going to be a lot easier on our, uh, our quality grade. We're going to have a higher percentage of choice compared to if we use a, a high dose implant as our terminal implant. So what implants utilize, the dose that's being utilized and the timing all can have factor in in terms of the, the carcass quality and the grading characteristics. Another example, um, this is a kind of a pilot study here. Uh, but looking at the previous plane of nutrition and the rate of growth in animals. So this is a, a trial where we randomize cattle and we put them in a situation where at, at backgrounding they were at a high rate of gain, two and a half pounds to three pounds per day. That's the blue bars compared to a low rate of gain. So they're gaining one and a half to two pounds a day. So Looking at that, we can see that the cattle that during the backgrounding phase had a higher rate of gain had a higher percentage of choice. So that may not work in every situation, but previous plane of nutrition and how those cattle were backgrounded can play a role in terms of the quality grade. And, and all of that are things that as a rancher, you, can't, you cannot control that. Whether those cattle are backgrounded for 60 days or 90 days, whether they went to grass first and then come into the feedlot, all can impact the grading. So those are some, some management production strategies that, that can play into it. Another, another example of management that can have an impact on, 
on carcass grading is um, how the bunk is managed and how we're managing feeding these cattle prior to shipment. So we had a, a large pen study where we, we randomized cattle and um, the, the, this particular feedlot uh, was right near the pack, packing plant. And they wanted the cattle to be killed first thing in the morning. So they were starting at 5 a.m. And the plant was worried about the amount of gut fill on these carcasses. So what they wanted to do was to have the feedlot not feed PM cover. So they'd feed the AM cover, but not feed the PM cover. And so we're, we were worried about the effects on the carcass quality by doing that. So we randomized the cattle. The gray bar is cattle that were fed normally. So with cattle going out first thing in the morning, the day prior, you'd have two covers of feed. The cattle in the orange bar were not fed the PM ration the day before. And what do we, which I talked about dark cutters, abnormal color of the muscle. So withholding the feed, we had a much higher rate of dark cutters. So nobody intentionally means to mismanage the feed, but there are things that happen, whether it's a, a storm event, whether it's cattle that w were actually, we thought they were gonna ship out today and the plant didn't take the cattle, so we didn't have it on the, the feed schedule to feed that pen because they're supposed to be gone and we missed it. So these are some real practical things that happen at the feedlot that can impact the, the carcass quality and have really nothing to do with um, the genetics or your cow herd or, or, or anything along those lines. Lastly, in terms of examples for you, um, this is a, another large pen study where we were interested in evaluating a byproduct that was being fed. So the, the the, the blue bars are the, the cattle that were fed the byproduct ration. The orange bars are the cattle that were fed the standard ration without the byproduct. And what do we see there? We see that cattle that were fed the byproduct ration have a greater percentage of choice and less select. And if we drop down over here and look at the yield grades, the byproduct cattle, we got, we got more quality grade in the cattle, greater proportion of, of choice, but we have less yield grade ones and twos, more fours and fives, so that kind of goes with what we'd expect. So do we really think that byproduct is inhibiting, or I shouldn't say inhibiting, is maximizing marbling de deposition? Probably not. Let's go down here and look here at carcass weight. So the cattle that were fed the byproduct ration gained faster, so they were 50 pounds heavier and we market them at the same days on feed. So this response here, while it could be the byproduct, probably has a lot to do with the effect of that ration on the rate of gain. So when, when we're thinking about implications here, whether it's an implant, whether it's um, diet, uh, previous rate of gain, you know, is it particularly that product or is it that product effect on the rate of gain? But either way, it can have implications in terms of what the, what the final results are in terms of, of carcass grade. This is just, I really want to hone in the carcass weight thing. So on the bottom here, we have carcass weight. We've got quality grade here. So as orange bar choice, so as we're increasing our carcass weight, we are seeing choice going up and gray bars select going down. So the, that's the, the take home me message in terms of, of the, the biggest factor when it comes to, to carcass grading is, is, um, is carcass weight. So lastly, I want to um, discuss just a little bit with you the, the data that wolf cattle is utilizing to make management decisions. So I have on the screen an example of a monthly report that they look at. Um, where we've got the individual kill lots, and we're looking at their carcass weight, their dressing percent, and their grading, but then we're comparing that to cattle marketed that month and the entire database. And so whether we're, we're comparing quality grade or whether we're comparing yield grade, we're using that information to figure out if we need to do something different. So if carcass weight is, is lower this month, 
or dressing percentages down, if we have the ability, we might um, extend shipments. And rather than shipping cattle when we thought we were, maybe we'll put another couple weeks on those cattle if, if we have the ability to do so. The other thing we look at is um, how these cattle will hit the grid. So if we have different grid arrangements, uh, we can look at, at the results and, and determine, well, these cattle would be better off going on grid A. These cattle would be better off going on grid B. So trying to be as real time as possible as we can, utilizing this data to, to make decisions. So um, we, we get to the end here. And uh, if we summarize kind of everything, um, we have the database there. And uh, I think it's great to be able to, to use that information to compare um, to your herd and see where, where improvements need to be made or, or see um, improvements that have been made. It's a general guide. Make sure you understand its, its limitations and how to interpret it. Um, management factors. Uh, you know, hopefully with the data I've, I've demonstrated to you, you can see that it can greatly affect your carcass grading, especially how the cattle are being marketed and the target weight that, that, they're, that we're taking the cattle to. In terms of carcass weight, you know, the feeding margin is going to be the, the indicator of what weight the cattle are going to go to. So if we've got a market that's going down, cattle are probably going to go out lighter and the cattle may not grade as well as what you would have liked or what you would have thought, but the feed yard is trying to optimize the profitability on, on those cattle. And we're looking at the, the carcass data um, monthly, if not more prevalently, to try to make decisions to, to figure out how to optimize profitability. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to, to Nate, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them now, or, or feel free to find me, um, and we can talk about it. Thank you, Sandy. Um, one quick, one quick uh, example that I think really would correlate well, or, or um, a lot of you would be able to relate to, um, with both Mark and Dr. Sandy's presentation, if you think back to the, the days where, you know, it was early on, probably seven years ago when I started with the company, we were marketing a lot of cattle to Laura's Lean Beef. So, so high percentage limousine cattle, a lot of them were going to Laura's Lean Beef, and, and they were, you know, we were sorting the cattle into those management groups probably 20% of our, our fed cattle out of our natural program were, were going that direction. You know, to a degree they were fed a, a little lower energy diet, marketed, you know, weighing 1350, so, so 850, 875 pound carcasses. And, you know, for, for reasons like Mark showed on some of that cattle facts data that the industry was moving to a, you know, more demand for, for choice grading cattle it was apparent that you know to, to keep our product marketable, you know higher grading cattle, you know to a degree we needed cattle to hit 80% choice and higher. So to start with, the, the premiums in other markets were, were were higher than the lower premium as cattle feeders, and then eventually what happened is is lower lean go, goes away, right? So so it's gone. Remember Jerry and I sitting there going, now what are we going to do with 20% of our fed cattle, and the you know, first thing was, you could see the, the graphs Mark presented, you know, where the, the, the marbling and, and the quality grades improving in the breed as a whole, but what did we do? He said, well, I think we can feed these cattle more corn, I think we can put another 100 pounds of carcass weight on them, and virtually, you know, those cattle turned into choice grading cattle in one year. <laughs> um, you know, right on the threshold because they're they're not implanted. So you you've seen the, the the difference that that can make, and and that really ties our program together and why we can why we can use the limousine, you know, crossed on Angus cows in these in these you know programs where we're not using the technologies, the NHTC program, the all natural program. We can we can use a breed that does have lower marbling than say say Angus, but still get a product product that works. Ship cattle at heavier outweighs. Mark alluded to what that does economically in cattle feeding, and um, 
and really that just want to give that brief story and on how that you know a real life example if you will on on how that uh ties it all together whether it's you know management or you know genetics that affect the and that's why it's really important when you do get those reports you do need to look at the database average for the year because depending on market economics etc you know all of our carcass weights might change 30 or 40 pounds that year and and that affects everybody's cattle so so there are changes year to year thank you sandy for putting in the ribeye equation because if you're shipping a calf fed you know a lighter carcass versus the uh, backgrounded yearling that goes out at a heavier weight your square inch measurement is not comparable on the lighter carcasses to the heavier carcasses so that that equation and that ratio I think will be very helpful to compare yourself to a database in a standardized way. So with that, um, Casey and I will field questions and for, for either Sandy or Mark. So Mark, maybe if you would, and Sandy, would you, in case, it, I'm sure there'll be questions, so why don't you just come up here? And mm -hmm. Go ahead. So the, the question was in that, that little the trial there on the ration withheld before the harvest of the cattle, did, did that affect dressing percent? Yeah, we did see a small difference in dress. It wasn't a huge difference. Um, dress actually got worse when we withheld the, the uh, I'm sorry, dress got worse whenever we didn't feed the cattle before. And so uh, when you're thinking about your dressing percent, that's your ratio of live weight to, to carcass weight. And so when we impacted the live weight by not, not feeding the, the ration, the, they got closer together. Yep. So following up on that question he had, so you have a tissue shrink there that was causing you to have a less by not feeding the cap. No, it wasn't tissue shrink. I think it was just gut fill. So if we had less feed in that rumen, and so therefore, if you're looking at the, the, let me back up a minute. The way I think about it is if you've got feed in that rumen, the live weight is gonna be greater. And so then if we're looking at what's the ratio of carcass weight to live weight, then if we've got a, a lower live weight, because we don't have the, the gut, that gut fill is going to hit the floor. It has nothing to do with tissue shrink at all. Um, if we would have extended that feed withdrawal for a longer period of time, that's whenever we, we probably would have got into the tissue shrink. I think it was just a matter of the gut. Great question, both of you. Thank you. All right, so uh, the, the question has to do with the, the byproduct ration. And so uh, our friend here wants to know if we saw differences in, in dry matter intake. And <laughs> you guys are putting me on the spot. I was looking at this data from the, the grading side. If I remember correctly, um, when we fed the byproduct, this was a wheat gluten byproduct, we did see an increase in dry matter intake as well as an in, the obvious increase in average daily gain that resulted in the, the heavier carcass. So the, the feed conversion, I don't remember if feed conversion was significantly different on that, but intake and gain were higher when the byproduct was fed. Does that help you out on that? Or? Yeah, that was the first part, the second part. Oh, which ones made the most money? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, it depends on what the cost of the byproduct was. This study was done about hmm, five, seven years ago, and yes, we fed that byproduct for, for a long period of time until the plant decided to change the cost of it. So depending on what the cost of the byproduct is, we, we will feed it or not. So we, we take all this trial.